So I'd like to welcome you to the annual meeting of the Century House Historical Society, which is traditionally accompanied by a, a lecture. And today we have Ms. Emily McCabe presenting a talk about her fantastic research. And uh, I'm going to hand the virtual mic over to her. Uh, thanks for coming. And let's uh, start our show. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I would like to uh, reassure everybody, uh, I am in the Century um, House Historical Society house right now. I'm not wearing a mask, but we are socially distanced, so don't worry. <laughs> um, I would like to thank the Century House Historical Society for hosting me. Uh, I'm going to start off this presentation by telling you a little bit about myself and how the project started. Uh, my name is Emily McCabe. I'm a graduate student at the University of Albany, where I'm finishing up my master's in history and library science. In the fall of 2018, I took a research course where a professor told us to go into an archive and write a story about any source we could find. Um, the Century House was kind enough to let me into their archive. I went in looking for a story about cement, of course, uh, because the Widow Jane is right there. Um, but sometimes when you go into an archive, you uh, don't really know what you'll find, especially if um, the archive belongs to an institution that collects from a wide community. So I found several scrapbooks and I chose the one that I saw the most reoccurring names in to base my project on. And that's what we, we will be talking about today. Um, we're going to start with a little history and then we're going to get into the tools I used to find my information and what that can mean for future projects. So I'm going to start screen sharing now. Um, if, uh, if anyone has any questions, um, I think there should be a Q&A section or a chat section. You can type them and uh, Henry will monitor. So let's switch over. Okay. So let's go. There we go. So December 1st, 1875, the passenger steamer Sunnyside hit ice and sank while on its voyage from Troy to New York City. This sinking led to the loss of 11 lives. Captain Frank Tyson, commanding the Sunnyside during the disaster, claimed that the Sunnyside could have been saved if passing vessel Walter Brett had answered the Sunnyside's uh, distress calls. According to reports, Captain Frank Tyson did his best to save his passengers. He ordered his lifeboats out. Uh, one was tragically lost to the water with fleeing passengers inside. And he ordered a guide rope to be taken to shore by his mate as the boats lowered. The sinking of the Sunnyside was a big deal at the time. Statewide papers covered the sinking first as a tragic disaster and then with criticism against Captain Tyson. The captain of the Walter Brett argued that neither he nor his men heard the uh, distress calls, nor saw any problem with the sunny side as they passed. Critics claimed that Captain Tyson's choice to go to sleep during the dangerous cross through thick ice caused the sinking. Captain Tyson received statewide backlash for his uh, alleged neglect. By the second half of the 19th century, Steamboat tourism was extremely popular. Artists like Thomas Cole literally and figuratively painted the Catskill Mountains as a beautiful, serene place of escapism in the early 1800s. In 1824, Gibbons v. Ogden officially ended the then monopoly the Fulton Livingston Line had on steamboats along the Hudson River, so steamboat manufacturing boomed. Steamboats became a practical, relatively affordable way to get from New York City up through Albany and Troy. Around that time, travel guides were being published that advertised the best routes to take by steamboat and celebrities were making their way up the river, which further encouraged elites, uh, the elites of New York City to leave too. By 1860, the state of New York had 46 inland steam navigation companies. 
there's a clip article of the Steamboat Boys. You can see it there um, on the left side of the screen, uh, screen in the scrapbook. It describes the crew of the Sunnyside Thomas Powell and the Rip Van Winkle readying for the end of the steamer season. Captain Frank Tyson's recently bought beautiful home in Lansingbury is featured, is featured twice. The steamer tourism business was important to the creator or creators of the scrapbook. Most of the articles in the scrapbook are, for, are from the Troy Daily Times. 16 of the articles are about steamboats and 13 of those 16 mention or focus on Captain Tyson. In what is easily the lengthiest steamboat related article clipped for the scrapbook, Joseph Cornell and other Troy entrepreneurs argued on behalf of the city of Troy to start a new steamboat line running between Troy and New York City. In the article, the line, which was founded in 1872 and initially consisted of the Thomas Powell and the Sunnyside, would provide consistent large steamers to ferry tourists to and from Troy and New York City. This, they argued, would bring back tourism uh, into Troy, which had suffered as a result of the Rensselaer and Saratoga Railroad refusing to bring passengers into Troy. The new line was called the Citizens Line and Captain Frank Tyson is not directly referenced in the article, but the steamer he captained at the time, the Vanderbilt, is. In an article dated uh, March 21st, 1874, a report of the Sunnyside's maiden venture puts Captain Frank Tyson on her deck. So that was a lot of history. We're going to shift gears and look at what's in the scrapbook now. Um, there's going to be a lot of images coming up in the next part, so bear with me. Uh, if there's anything you'd like a closer look at, we can always go back. Uh, so, firstly, the first page with writing clearly states F. Tyson's count book. The pages hold what seem to be meticulous accounting between the years 1838 and 1840 in the same handwriting, pasted uh, over nearly every page are dozens of clippings from the Troy Daily Times uh, dated decades after the accounting stops when dates are included at all. Most of the clippings include local and national news, uh, home remedies and recipes. You can see in the center there um, a radical cure for the piles. Uh, and fugitive verses, which were typically anonymous poems published between the 19 or published in 19th century newspapers. There's an example of one um, there on the right. Also included in the scrapbook are letters and telegraphs uh, pasted onto the pages, mostly referring or addressed to Captain Tyson. Lastly, there are notes written directly onto the blank spaces below clippings and toward the back of the scrapbook signed mostly by James H. Mills, Anna M. Tyson, and Frank Tyson Jr. So there is no indication of who made the scrapbook or when. James H. Mills and Anna M. Tyson had access to it, but there, is no, there are no notes on when or why it switched hands between them. There's no direct statement of what relationship James H. Mills had to the Tysons, only that he knew the Tysons well enough to write about Captain Tyson's life. On a signed note by him, uh, one signed note by him reads, Captain F. Tyson took his first sleigh ride of the season on Saturday, 30, November 30th, 72, JHM. Another Captain F. Tyson, Lansingberg above a uh, drawing of a dove and olive branch surrounded by a ribbon with long may he wave slash hail to Cap Tyson. Those images are above, uh, are, or I should say in front of you. Uh, in total, the named members of the Tyson family mentioned in the scrapbook are Captain Frank Tyson, Frank Tyson Jr., Charles Tyson, Chaz Tyson Jr. and wife, and Anna M. Tyson. In 2018, I chose to focus the story of my project on the sinking of the Sunnyside. I did this because the story of Captain Tyson told through the scrapbook is different than what we can find looking into newspaper archives. In a possible act of dramatic irony, 
there's an article in the scrapbook from April 13th, 1875, about eight months before the sinking, that describes Captain Tyson commenting on his recent difficulty navigating the icy waters of the Hudson. There are no clippings of articles about the sinking of the sunny side in the scrapbook, but there is a lengthy handwritten note by James H. Mills about the incident. Steamboat Sunnyside sunk December 1st, 1875, a breast Hyde Park while encountering heavy ice on her last trip to New York and 11 lives were lost. Captain Frank got home from the wreck Saturday, December 4th, 1875 and returned Monday, December 6th, 1875 to wreck. Below that on the same sheet of paper, navigation closed December 1st, 1875, no snow, Captain Fernahan, uh, and ex-mayor and General Carr visited, uh, visited Captain F. Tyson on Sunday, December 4th, 1875. Then Chaz Tyson Jr. and wife and Jake Burnham and wife came to see the captain on Sunday evening, December 5th, 1875, then Monday, December 6th, splendid day. This version of the story is not of neglect, but of a terrible accident, a man receiving emotional support from family and friends and then choosing to return to the site of his trauma. It paints a more flattering picture of Captain Frank Tyson uh, than any of the papers did at the time. So which is the truth or which is more the truth? As public historians working with family documents, this scenario will come up a lot. Not every story is as dramatic as a fatal steamboat sinking, but when we work with documents purchased or donated from the community, there is always going to be a degree of bias in storytelling, unreliable narrators, or missing context. Creating scrapbooks out of clippings and old count books was the 19th century equivalent of using Pinterest or Facebook now, which is why so many of them tend to focus on random individuals and include recipes and remedies. Most people on Facebook don't say their relatives come to visit them and then give a biography of that relative's life. Whoever created the scrapbook probably didn't expect it to end up in historical society 70 miles away. It's possible they didn't expect it to be handed off from James H. Mills to Anna M. Tyson or vice versa, or from a separate party that uh, might have put the scrapbook together. So if we want to know more about the Tysons or even just Captain Frank Tyson, outside research is necessary. Luckily, as we've gone over, st steamboat crews and captains were minor celebrities in the second half of the 19th century. This means that even if we only have Captain Frank Tyson's name, we have a starting point. We know from articles in the scrapbook that he captained the sunny side and that he owned property in Troy. We can plug those keywords into a search engine and start our research. There are many newspaper archives available online. Probably the most popular one is newspapers.com, which is tied to ancestry.com, which we will be discussing uh, in a moment. I use newspapers.com and the Gale Primary Sources 19th Century US Newspapers Database, which I know is a mouthful, uh, to search articles about a Frank Tyson in New York State between the years 1830 and 1900, which are arbitrary dates uh, I chose because I thought they would give me a spread of articles. The Gale Database allowed me to choose document type, so I narrowed my I search to articles, birth announcements, death notices, editorials, letters to the editor, marriage announcements, newspaper, and obituary. I figured that if he was really a celebrity, people would probably write about him in a couple different ways. This search, uh, this search gave me two results. The first is titled Sunk in the Ice from the Daily Inter ocean paper out of Chicago, dated December 8th, 1875. It reports on the sinking of the sunny side, gives names of the victims, two different accounts of the event, and a description of the sunny side. Captain Tyson is mentioned, but mostly in passing in the article. We are told he is the captain and that he discovered the leak in the ship. But that's okay, because we're also given other important clues. James Mills is listed among the crew as wheelsman. The second article, Hotel Arrivals from the Rocky Mountain News out of Denver, October 13th, 1877, lists a Frank Tyson as well. This article, for the sake of an initial search, can be discarded. 
First, because we don't know if this is our Frank Tyson, because the place of origin seems to be Poughkeepsie, New York. And second, because we don't, it doesn't relate to steamboats at all. I followed the same methodology over on newspapers.com. I narrowed the search dates from uh, to 1840 to 1900. This time included the search terms Frank Tyson and Captain and got 114 results back. Newspapers.com does not give the title of the articles in its list, but it will give a preview of the article, which publication it's from and what dates. If we wanted to do a deep dive into all of these articles, we absolutely could do that but for the purposes of quickly searching for names in relation to occupations and locations, just glancing at the preview can give us an indication of how useful the article might be. For example, the first two articles listed are from 1891 and 1892 and mention a Frank Tyson Jr. who is an engineer and lives in New York City. Could this be the Frank Tyson Jr. from the scrapbook? Possibly. Clicking on the articles, however, show an ad for Ayers Sarsaparilla and no mention of Troy or steamboats, so apparently not useful for us. The third article down from the Brooklyn Eagle, July 28th, 1870, mentions Captain Frank Tyson in full. In this article, we are told that Captain Tyson commands the Vanderbilt in Troy. We're told details of the boats uh, of the boat and its route. Some scrapbook articles already told us that Captain Tyson commanded the Vanderbilt for a time. This confirms that fact and gives us a little more of a time frame. When we order the result by oldest publication date instead of by relevancy, we see an article out of Buffalo for March 27th, 1868. It's a section on marine intelligence that notes the Vanderbilt and its crew, again with Captain Tyson commanding. Before that, an article from the Rutland Weekly Herald in Vermont, September 26th, 1867, reports on another accident in the Hudson in which the Vanderbilt under Captain Tyson's command hit and sank the Dean Richmond, which resulted in one death. This article alleges that at the time of the collision, no one was piloting the Vanderbilt. So now we can expand our estimate of Captain Tyson's timeline to being on the Vanderbilt from 1867 to probably 1872. We also now have evidence of at least one accusation of prior negligence on Captain Tyson's part. If we ordered the articles by most recent publishing date, we get articles from 1900 and the 1890s that can be immediately dismissed. Either the articles are about non-New York Frank Tysons or they are re of the Frank Tyson Jr. ad, which, by the way, ran that exact ad ran four years in various papers. Also, changing the keyword from Captain to Sunnyside gets us different results. Notably, another article that places a Frank Tyson with two S's as a pilot on the steamer Milwaukee in 1871 Wisconsin, which is possible but unlikely to be our Captain Frank Tyson. The New Orleans Weekly Democrat on November 2nd, 1878 rep uh, reports on a Troy engineer called Frank Tyson Jr. who describes to the reporter a new torpedo boat. Thanks to this article and the ads both starring a Frank Tyson Jr. who's an engineer, we can now keep that in mind for census data too. According to these initial searches on newspapers.com, the last time Captain Frank Tyson appears is in 1876. The articles all say the same thing. Those investigating the sinking found Captain Frank Tyson to be guilty of negligence. His license as captain and first class pilot were revoked for one year. Quoted from the article, they say that he should have been personally on watch, attending to the welfare and security and the safety of the lives of the passengers and crew and the property committed to his care. So that's a bummer, right? I mean, it's very different from the man we're shown in the scrapbook. It also makes the notes by James H. Mills on the sunny side more meaningful because we now know that he was there during the tragedy too. We also now have an idea of who Frank Tyson Jr. might be and why James H. Mills might have had access to the scrapbook and intimate knowledge of Captain Frank Tyson's life. We've gotten about as far as newspaper clippings alone are going to take us. So now to learn more about the family, we're going to switch tools and look at genealogy. Okay. Ancestry, 
Genealogy.com is the world's most popular genealogy site. For a fee and at different membership levels, users have access to hundreds of thousands of public records across the world, from census lists to marriage and death records. Ancestry.com also works with newspapers.com to provide more ac or access to more archives. The reason I'm telling you this quick, weird advertisement is to emphasize how useful that is to a public historian. You don't need to go to a library or an archive to look at their records if they've digitized them and put them on Ancestry.com. You can do it from home or in the office. Further, Ancestry.com includes records that people might have just found in their attic or basement or wherever their family members keep. There are old documents that otherwise would have been inaccessible because they're not in a repository. The danger that comes with Ancestry.com and to an extent with Newspapers.com is that anyone can post a document to the site, um, type in the repository they found it in and their own personal transcriptions and record descriptions. I know it sounds like I'm about to warn against the dangers of malicious bad actors, but really the more common issues arise in people not traditionally trained in history misinterpreting documents. The best example I can give to this is I know Captain Tyson's name is pronounced Tyson because uh, in some census forms uh, and transcriptions, his last name is misspelled as T-Y-S-O-N, Tyson. In some other forms, however, it's spelled with a T-E-A or an L-E-A, so it really depends. I'm not immune to this either. While looking over the Tyson family tree for the first time in years, I saw that another user made a family tree for Frank Tyson, presumably because he's a relative, and I saw some pretty big discrepancies between our trees. As you can see in this top image, comparing our Frank Tysons, mine is on the uh, right side. You can see the same name, same birth year estimation, and similar names in the family but I gave Frank Tyson a second wife and an extra child. Digging further into the family tree, I can see that we both have one of Frank's sons, Hiram, married to a woman born around the same time and having a daughter by the same name, um, as you can see from the bottom images. Here are the entries on our respective trees. I clicked on Hiram's wife's profile and it turned out that we used the same source for her as you can see here. The other user just changed her name to Kate instead of Caddy, which I had entered because that's what is literally written on the census, as you can see. Also pictured here is a misspelling of Tyson. If this is a family member who has the extra context of having met Hiram's wife or his children, then they would know how her name should be written and pronounced. I only have my best guess. When documents and other sources have differing information, which could be dates, names, or entire sections of a family, researchers have to use their best judgment on what information to include and what to set aside. And sometimes that decision can have you going in circles for hours. Full disclosure, I spent hours in 2018 building a family family tree for the Tyson family. Here is a full picture of what I ended up with. I actually didn't find the newspaper article that lists James H. Mills as a wheelsman until I was editing the project for this presentation, so his family tree was left extremely sparse, as you can see. I'd mostly given up on it and focused on the Tysons. In fact, the conclusion for the research paper um, that I wrote use JHM as a sort of linchpin to my thesis because he clearly had so much knowledge of Captain Tyson but had so little archival presence in and outside of the scrapbook. I said that he can't be considered a reliable narrator even if he is the one who gives us the most information about Captain Tyson's daily life because we don't know who he is or how he knows all this information. Clearly, Either I missed a few things in my research or that particular article hadn't been uploaded yet. So to demonstrate how Ancestry.com can be used to build a family timeline, let's reevaluate James H. Mills. 
If you already have a general idea of the name, birth year, and location of a person, Ancestry.com will have a series of hints that are documents or other users' family trees that have similar names or keywords used in them. If we look at my hint, we can see two suggested family trees and a New York census. If we're, uh, we're going to ignore the family trees for now because I'm not sure about the birth date, but the census list has the correct location attached, so that'll give me a better place to start than clicking through a family tree. If we click on the record, we can see that James Mills is 10 years old in this census, which is from 1865. We know that James H. Mills was a crewman on the sunny side in 1875, so it's possible he could have been 20 years old at the time of the sinking. We don't know for sure, but since I'm essentially starting from scratch, I'm going to click yes and approve this connection. Once you accept the hint, the family tree is updated. We can now see that the Mills family tree has additional people and names on it. Back on the hints page, there are two matching death announcements for James H. Mills and Troy for 1901. I'm going to approve both of these as a maybe to get a rough estimate of his life, though this would give him a tragically early death in his 40s. Further searches into hints give us census data that either puts him as a child or puts him as working as a bookkeeper or in a shop before and after 1872 through 1875, the years we know that J.H.M. was interacting with the Tysons. These are possible for his timeline since he could have gotten a job off the river. There is a Francis Tyson listed in a later directory as being both a captain and the proprietor of the American House Hotel. In that same census, a James H. Mills is listed as being a clerk. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any information about J.H.N.'s older teenage and young adult years to definitively put him on a steamer in 1875. Visiting the family trees we had previously skipped in the hopes of more insight uh, gave us some family names with mostly blank profiles. Searching Ancestry.com with a set of parameters of name, gender, time period, recorded location, and keywords also yielded no convincing results. I turned back to the Tyson family trees and saw that one of uh, Frank Tyson's children, Hiram again, married a Nellie according to the other user's tree. The James H. Mills I had on my tree has a sister called Nellie, born around the same time. I hoped there could be a family connection, but searches into the possible connections came up with no overlap. The Tyson family has clearer documentation across censuses and directories, but there's still a lot of confusion there too. We know that an, uh, we know that an Anna M. Tyson had possession of the scrapbook at uh, one time, but there are actually two Anna M's in the Tyson family. One was married to Charles Tyson, Frank Tyson's brother, and one might have been in some sort of relationship with Captain Frank Tyson. You can see them here um, on the family tree. The details of Anna M. M. Tyson's relationship with Captain Tyson are unclear, since we can see from census records that Captain Tyson fathered several children with a Caroline Tyson. Caroline, at some point, began living with her son Hiram and his family, as you can see listed here. Caroline is listed in directories as widow beginning around 1880, but a Captain Frank, uh, Francis Tyson is still alive and listed below her. It is possible that the Francis Tyson listed as captain and associated with the American House is Francis Tyson Jr., but in other directory and census listings from 1880 and 1881, Francis Tyson is listed as being a hotel keeper and living with Anna M. Tyson. This listed Francis Tyson is too old to be Francis Tyson Jr. Further, in an 1879 directory, Francis Tyson is listed as being a captain and Francis Tyson Jr. is still listed as an engineer below him, as you can see. So genealogy is messy. 
The other user's family tree doesn't acknowledge Anna M. Tyson at all and claims that Caroline's husband died before or around 1880. If I had to guess, Captain Frank and Caroline Tyson might have divorced sometime in the 1870s. Caroline might have remarried and then lost her new husband. Excuse me a moment. The details of Anna M. Tyson's relationship with Captain Tyson are unclear. So, oh, no. <laughs> Excuse me. There's a telegram in the scrapbook addressed to Mrs. Annie M. Tyson from J. Cornell that reads, Sunnyside leaves here Friday night from 1874. In the back of the scrapbook, there is what appears to be a diary entry entitled Lonesome Day that's dated June 12th, 1882, signed by Anna M. Tyson. It is still unclear which Anna M. Tyson had control of the scrapbook, but she did practice writing hers and Captain Tyson's names over and over, as you can see on the right. Understanding who the people in the scrapbook were to each other would be impossible without outside research, but even with outside research, there are gaps in knowledge. So where does that leave us? Well, first, despite the many dead ends we ran into, I hope I demonstrated the benefit of newspaper databases and genealogy tools. It's true, sources can be incomplete, poorly transcribed, hidden behind paywalls, or just not uploaded in time for our research. But public history is a collaborative field in which the people participating don't always know how they're helping to set up an exhibit or write an article. The goal of public historians should be to encourage better practices and more participation in newspaper archives and genealogy sites, not blame those contributing for any problems we run into. Second, we might not have a complete story here, but we do have a story. We know that the Sunnyside sank in December of 1875, a tragedy that deeply affected the captain of the ship. We know that after the Sunnyside sank, no more clippings of steamboat news were put into the scrapbook, implying that either the subject was too painful to continue to talk about or that a possible new owner of the scrapbook just wasn't that interested in the news. We know that J.H.M. was a big fan of Captain F. Tyson, and we know that Anna M. Tyson was also a big fan. When we add in the extra context of the newspapers in genealogy, we know that at least two of Captain Tyson's sons also worked on or with steamboats. We know that James H. Mills was the wheelsman during the sinking of the sunny side, and we know that Captain Tyson had been involved with another sinking tragedy less than a decade prior. We know that this was such big news at the time that several publications across the state and even out of the state reported on the situation for at least a year. And we know that Captain Tyson lost his captain's license for a time and that soon after the incident, he started investing in a hotel. This is the story of, a rise, of the rise and fall of a local celebrity steamboat captain during the heyday of steamboat industry. And all of this started from finding a scrapbook in an archive. Thank you. I have a question. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, you know, do, you, do you know who the victims were? Yes, I do. Well, not off the top of my head, but several um, of the articles uh, listed the names of them. I know that in the Sunnyside sinking, um, six of the victims were just travelers, like tourists, normal tourists. Five of the 11 victims were actually um, African-American servants. And actually the victim of the, um, uh, the Dean Richmond sinking was also a, a young black boy who was also a servant. So that's also a, um, I was hoping somebody would ask this because uh, I couldn't fit this into the um, presentation proper, but uh, one of the cool things about doing research for this type of event is looking at, um, you know, intersectionality between other fields. So if we didn't want to focus on Captain Tyson, we could look at, well, how does race play into um, all of this? How does race play into 19th century tourism? Etc. Um, I don't know if Henry wants to 
curate any other questions or if, if we, we don't have a lot of people, so I don't know if um, it would be people better. Pop in if they want to. Um, yeah. But uh, I'm also curious if you found other documents that were associated with this or it was just an isolated scrapbook. Uh, so it was just an isolated scrapbook. I did some digging in the um, archive office and in that little library room next to it to see if I could find any uh, finding aid or extra description to go along with the scrapbook and I couldn't. Um, there were a couple of other scrapbooks, but it seemed like they were um, unaffiliated with this one, unfortunately. Thank you. Dietrich was such a, a, a wide ranging collector from what little I've had in the archives that it, this, this is something that, you know, we might eventually right. find a, a receipt for, but he just collected widely across a lot of different topics. But oh, it's yeah. great to, it's great to see what you made. You did a wonderful job. It's great to see what you made of it. Yeah. Thank you. There were a few stumbles. Um, started losing my voice there a little bit, but we, we, we worked it out. Um, I will say 19th century scrapbooking is not, I don't want to say it's an ignored part of, um, of public history because there are definitely at least two books written about it, at least two, um, possibly only two. Uh, but it's um, uh, it's it's an interesting field because, uh, as I mentioned, you know they really were used as like the Pinterest of the 19th century. So you can't rely on them entirely for stories, but um, so many families made scrapbooks like this, um, you know, with clipping out these newspaper articles and pasting them down. Um, if we, oh, I don't know if I can go back to screen share, but um, Henry, can I go back to screen sharing? So. You'd be able to. Uh, let's see if I can show an example. Um, excuse me while I backtrack a lot. Um, no, 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 no. There we go. Uh, on the right side, if you look at the top of that um, digital verse, you see like for the scrapbook or something written in there. You know, for the journal. Yep. Newspapers would print these verses and then like tell people to clip them out. And I think uh, uh, one of the famous, I can't, one of the um, sources I was reading on 19th century scrapbooking, um, I think Walt Whitman specifically, or, or one of that like character, like archetype of characters, uh, really encouraged people to um, cut out clippings and post them. It's, you know, it's a tiny part of history, but it's um, really interesting when you look at it. As an antique dealer, I've seen, you know, dozens maybe uh, I own a couple, not that I've actually studied, but they, I find them fascinating. So it's yeah. great to see somebody make use of them. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, I can just talk about random things that I couldn't include um, if you want. I have like a whole list. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, um, when I gave this, when I practiced giving this presentation to um, a colleague of mine, one of the questions was asked, that was asked was, well, how can I be sure that uh, the two Anna M's, um, I'm gonna go back to screen sharing, I'm sorry. The two Anna M's aren't uh, the same person, which is a great question. Um, and the answer to that, I can get back to my screen, there we go. If you look uh, on the family tree, you can see, um, let me see if I can get the arrows. There we go. You can see Anna M. Tyson uh, connected to Francis and Anna Freeman connected to Charles. So Anna um, did marry Charles, but she's called Anna Freeman for my personal notes to differentiate them while I was doing research, but also because she was previously married. Uh, and so she has a will later in her life that is also on Ancestry.com that names Chaz Jr. as her stepson. Um, so we know that there is an Annie slash Anna M connected to Charles. And then in the census information, here again, we can see another Anna M who's listed as Francis Tyson's uh, wife. 
Um, so that's uh, an indication, for example, of how we know that they're two different people. Um, it did make researching them difficult though, uh, because both of them um, go by Annie M or Anna M, depending on the directory or census taker. And also both of them died in the same year, apparently. So um, trying to create any kind of timeline for them was confusing. <laughs> But, but you're sure it actually is two different people. It was common for unmarried siblings to marry. So your brother died and you were mm -hmm. a marriage. Very often you'd marry your brother's wife in, in the 19th century, we see. So so I'm curious whether they couldn't be, you know, you'd have to find the data points that make it yeah. clear it's two different people, right? I mean, not yeah. that that was what you were setting out to do. You know, oh, so. yeah. Well, so the, the death dates that I find for them give two separate, like the years are the same, but the death dates are the same. But then also there's some census um, listings that have uh, um, also Annie or Anna listed as being a widow at various times with or without Charles. So it, it's definitely possible that they could still be the same person. Um, but the at least the research I got to, um, that pointed in, at the very least, two separate marriages. So I kind of went with it. Although now that you bring that up, that's uh, you know, very yeah, smart. no, from yeah, well, you know, you just see it. If you do enough reading, you see these things enough. You know, oh, then he married, his, you know, or his brother died. He married, you know, so so it it, it, it very well even with the separated dates. Uh, the thing that start you start to question is if they say she's a widow and she's remarried, it's, they might still say yeah. she was a widow that remarried, you know. So it, yeah, it's hard, but that's the fun mm -hmm. of it too. And, and uh, it's always fun to see where these turns that yeah. your research take you to. You know? Yeah, there's also um, some directories that list both uh, Anna M and Caroline, like in the same, you know, family bulk. Um, and in a lot of those, Caroline is listed as a widow, but Anna isn't, which just, add, again, adds to the confusion. <laughs> um, she was a widow, then she married the brother. And, uh, yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, kind of, so who knows? Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey? Uh, yeah, thanks so much. This is this was really interesting. I really Thank appreciate you. it. And I'm, I'm kind of, I have to apologize, I'm kind of a machine person, so I have to ask the question, like, what kind of boat, I mean, do you have any information, like, what kind of did, was it was it a coal powered steamboat or and and yeah. so w w was this a common occurrence like how how common was this kind of accident or you know in, in comparison because it's yeah. clearly it's an event that um a tragic event but i was wondering like how common Ooh, was it? Alex. um so unfortunately i do not know the super the details of the ship itself um my focus in history is more on like the cultural movement, not so much like the technical um, aspects. Yeah. <laughs> uh, many of the articles do give like size, for instance, and dimensions of the ship, but um, uh, I, I kind of skipped over those beyond just mentioning that, oh yes, this article mentions how big the ship is. Um, that being said, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't say how common it is, but from the um, articles that I found, you know, just doing research on tourism in general, it, I, I assume that they didn't have navigation completely figured out, but because of how big of a deal this um, uh, incident was and how widely reported is it, I, I assume it was a little bit of an event, as you said, like uncommon. Uh, it's also possible that they made such a big deal out of it because of how many people died, not necessarily um, because the ship sank itself. Because when steamboats were um, first coming around, like nobody believed in them. Nobody thought that they were safe and that you could actually travel in one reliably. Um, I think, I, I don't know the exact details, but I know the general picture of the story of how um, Fulton got his patent on um, steamboats up till the 1820 or 1824 and how, um, you know, he was trying to prove to people that he could reliably get along a river um, at a respectable speed and, and there's all these newspaper reports of like uh, reporters and hecklers essentially standing on 
the banks expecting <laughs> the steamboat to just completely run aground or something like people ready to make fun of him because they were so sure that steamboats just aren't that reliable but by the time you get to um the later 1800s steamboat travel was so common and so um lucrative of a business uh tourism wise that um <laughs> I guess for lack of better way of putting it, like they kind of had to be safer because you had all these rich people from New York City on them. Yeah. Um, uh, I will also say in some of the articles that report on the um, uh, on the sunny side sinking and that do uh, interviews with the survivors, um, quite a few of the interviews come off as kind of frivolous almost like I, I don't want to judge people on how they grieve or how they process trauma but there are definitely some of the passengers who are like yeah that was wild it was really exciting um so that leads me to believe that uh this was maybe more of a spectacle than like a common occurrence interesting interesting i, I, I could add one, one thing, that, oh, two do. things to that. Uh, so it's well known that the in the steam. Well, first as to fuel, Jeff. By that time, by the 1830s, the DNH company assiduously courts steamboats and successfully does it. And and then you read things where they talk about how much more BTU. Basically, they don't put it that way. You know uh, how much more <laughs> further you can go on a load of coal than you could on a load of, of, of wood. So it was almost certainly powered by coal at that point. And oh. the safety issue on steamboat is 95 or 98% probability. It was largely, you might in a race go and start burning the furniture, which is what I'm getting to. <laughs> Prior to the invention of the pressure relief valve, which was in the 1850s, steam steam engines blew up promiscuously. Famously, oh. yeah, yeah. So it, you know, it, it, to, the, to the point where they had a thing called the safety barge. And it was a barge. It had no motive power. Beautifully appointed, there's a bar and everything, but it's being towed behind the steamboat. So when something hits the fan up front, you're, you're, you're safe in the safety barge. And, but by this time after the Civil War, somebody somewhere in the 1850s, some genius and you know it seems so obvious to all of us uh, one of the one of the early dnh locomotives exploded well this was common for the first hundred years because what seems obvious to us now put a valve in there so when the pressure gets to 200 uh, uh, pounds per square inch something lets loose before it turns into shrapnel but they didn't do it for almost a century <laughs> so uh, you know by that time and famously uh, one of the landscape ar architects dies after a race with the, so all the steamboats wanted to say they were the fastest boats on the hudson mm -hmm. Um, so there were these fires and problems, and, and and finally the law steps in when it wasn't, I can't remember which of the landscape ar 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 architects dies saving people from a fire that was the result of a race. So safety issues, they, they, they forbid the steamboats from racing. Uh, um, and as I say, eventually you get this technology, the pressure relief valve, which makes steam power much more tenable because now they're not blowing up, as I say, promiscuously. <laughs> well... All this information actually brings up a, a good uh, point. I mean, very, that was very helpful, but um, I focused a lot on public history in this uh, um, presentation because that's what my research was on, but also because, you know, genealogy and, and newspapers are a really big part of working and volunteering at a museum. But that's a good point that um, that can only take you so far. I didn't know any of this. Um, and if I had just kept to newspapers and hadn't asked a uh, more, you know, experienced historian or somebody who's more academically trained in the history of steamboats as like machinery, um, you know, I, I wouldn't know that. And then the exhibit, if I was making an exhibit out of this would be less complete. So um, there's definitely more uh, research that can always be done on a subject. and. Um, public history being a collaborative field doesn't just mean relying on other people for uploading stuff. It also means reaching out and asking people if they can uh, look at a story through another lens or um, if they can add further context to it. Well, quite honestly, one of the most rewarding aspects of being a, a professional historian is the interaction 
Mm -hmm. um, um, that not all historians are generous. Some think they own their stories. I decry that. Mm -hmm. um, but I can say uh, with Jeffrey right here, in fact, Jeff, Jeff, in the course of his research, uh, I didn't know that Sojourner Truth's son worked as a lock tender. Well, he probably wasn't a lock tender, but he worked for a lock tender. And it's part of a story I tell now. But Jeff sent it to me from some research he was doing. And in mm -hmm. fact, I find very much with historians like Jeff and other people that I work with that it really pays to be generous because they, they, it's generous back and none of us get a complete story without collaboration. And so I, I, I love that you're talking about that. In fact, we all are better for collaboration. Yes. And we get a more accurate picture if we really care about what really happened, as opposed to telling a good story. That's another pet peeve. I've heard, you know, historians say, oh, but it makes a good story. Yeah. Uh, that's, oh, yeah, that's fine. But, but, but well, no, 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 that's not enough. That's, you know, mm -hmm. or at least if you're going to tell that story, you know, the difference between lore and, and, and something that you can verify from a primary source. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, yeah. Important distinction for people to make and people don't always make it, you know. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. I'm, I'm just reading the comments now. <laughs> yes, Jeffrey. Right, so, yeah, so just quick question, what's next for you? What's next? Well, um, on Thursday, I take a field exam and hopefully pass it and then I graduate. Um, I'm currently working in an access services at a, muse, um, at a library. Um, an academic library, but I hope to go into the public history fields. I've been aggressively applying to various um, museums and uh, projects. The uh, Museum Association of New York had a fellowship recently that they were canvassing for um, that uh, is, is essentially a fellowship that comes from a grant through the CARES Act, which was supposed to, um, not the CARES Act, the grant was supposed to help museums and um, libraries and just smaller cultural institutions kind of digitize to, um, uh, you know, allow for thriving during quarantine and reduced um hours and whatnot uh and i was really excited to go for that because i'm i'm really interested in helping uh smaller institutions reach their communities um but uh, it just didn't work out um but I'm, I'm really looking for uh you know all types of opportunities but mostly opportunities like that you know um Unfortunately, or I should say for, fortunately, New York State is very saturated with historians. Um, so it means that uh, I'll probably have to end up branching out of New York State, which is a shame because I love the Catskill Mountains and the Hudson River Valley. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, if given the opportunity, I'd probably want to stay looking at um, environmental history specifically early american environmental history so that um can include you know literally the history of conservation in the united states and um the history of how humans interact with nature but it's also very uh interdisciplinary so that includes um culture like 19th century tourism it also includes um early american naturalists um and uh, industrialization and just all that. It's super fascinating. I'll have to get better at, um, oh, what, what book is that? Oh. oh yeah, Environmental History in the Hudson River. Yep, perfect. There was yeah. a pres presentation at the Maritime Museum about a month ago about some of the early uh, uh, preservationists of the mm -hmm. Hudson River, fascinating, mainly women. Yeah, uh, um, which which was which was good to hear because uh, misogyny is uh, alive and rampant, just as almost as yeah. badly as racism still. So, yes, sure is. Um, and the, this is not associated with my presentation, but for fun fact, for those um, not familiar with um, environmental history, uh, in the late 1600s, throughout the 1700s, into a little bit the 1800s, um, uh, all of the big important thinkers were in London and obviously London is far away from 
America. And so they would essentially hire people from the colonies to do all of the collecting and observing of nature for them. And that kind of gave an opportunity for mostly white women to um, contribute to, I don't want to say the scientific community because it was a lot more collecting and putting in like curiosity cabinets than actually, um, uh, you know, doing experiments. But um, it, it, just a fun fact, highly suggest looking into it. <laughs> um, in the 19th century, natural philosophers, scientists, it wasn't, we didn't get the gradations that we get today. Yeah. And so people were just natural philosophers and they would, yeah. they would have much broader uh, interest that they'd study. You know, we, 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 Oh, Bill, get it down into much more specialization than was common 200 years ago, historically, yeah. you know. Yeah, but then into the 1800s, um, especially uh, around the 1820s, like again with Thomas Cole and the other Hudson River Valley, um, or uh, Hudson River School of Art and everything. Um, that's really when we get uh, conservation and um, uh, building like a national identity around nature and preserving nature and everything. Super interesting. Um, another thing that I went, that, that topic I also went into with my research paper, but didn't really fit into this presentation, unfortunately. Well, it was Teddy, Ted, Teddy Rosen. Oh, Bill. And, uh, and Pinochet, if you go to, um, what is it, Great Gardens down in Milford, he, he sort of credited Teddy and mm -hmm. this guy are kind of credited with, with jumpstarting the conservation movement in the turn of the 20th century. Yeah. If you have, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's sort of considered the godfather. You know. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, if there are any other questions about this project specifically, I'd be happy to talk about them. Um, not that I'm not happy to just in general talk about art or art and uh, history and stuff, but I'm sure it, it must be a little, um, I don't know, uh, alienating for the people who um, haven't read like 15 books about Thomas Cole. <laughs> it's okay if you don't. Oh, yep. Jeffrey. I have one more question. I don't know how much time you have to talk, but I don't want to take up. <laughs> uh, I think we're, I think we're okay. We started a little late, so we're still within the hour timeline or time frame. One of the, so I, I, I do historical archaeology, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a combination of history and archaeology. And so one of the interesting things to me about your project is the materiality of the scrapbook itself and how different that is to actually have this object sitting in front of you. Because um, I've been working with the archives too, and sometimes you'll pull a book out and you'll sneeze and it'll be full of coal yeah. dust or something, you know. Yeah. It's, a, it's a sensory experience that's very different than being online and having things at a distance. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, I absolutely can. And first, I would like to start off by saying that um, touching old stuff is scary. Like you are, or at least I, I shouldn't say you in general, I am always <laughs> terrified that I'm going to touch an old um, piece of paper and it's just going to crumble in my hands. Uh, and this is true, um, you know, in, in digging through a library, like looking for a source to use or in an extremely controlled environment where I'm wearing gloves, either way, always so scared to touch and then destroy something. Um, it's, it's really, I think it's, it's a weird in a good way feeling, you know, because uh, we don't, we don't know who created this scrapbook and we don't know why or when it switched hands between people, but people cared about it. I mean, um, I didn't have any full uh, pictures in this presentation of full pages, but you know, the, um, the handwriting of the accounting under it is so meticulous and um, the articles that are clipped down are perfectly aligned and you can see like the the old glue creeping out under it but somebody clearly tried so hard to keep it neat and even the doodles that JHM did and the letters and everything those are um, pasted around the articles so you know someone took care in creating this and then whoever had it next took care in not destroying whatever came before it um, and it's just with 
with that knowledge comes a lot of like um, self pressure to not, again, not mess up the scrapbook itself, like not break it, but also to try and figure out why they cared about it so much. Um, and again, the story, the answer to that might just be, well, it was in their family, so it's their diary, so they wanted to take care of it. But you know, it's it's really, it's it's just. It, it, it's great um, working with something in person. And it's also easier in a lot of ways. I mean, um, it's cool to see, uh, you know, census and directory pages um, on online, uh, like we're in my presentation, but um, I'm a very, um, like, I don't know, if textile or tactile, there we go, tactile person. Um, so, you know, looking at something online is different than being able to like flip through and like quickly look between things. Um, uh, it's just, it's just really fun. Uh, I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but um, I can definitely say there's, it, there's definitely something different about um, having an old thing in your hands versus seeing um, that old thing like on a museum page or something. Although I will say going off of that, I'm also a large proponent of digitalization of materials. There are a lot of institutions now that put their um, bigger collections online and some institutions, like I think the Smithsonian will do like full 3D renderings of some of their objects. And that's fantastic because otherwise, you know, like the whole world of people would never be able to see what's in these museums collections otherwise because most people even outside of a pandemic can't travel across the country to see you know xyz exhibit um but there really is something different about seeing and touching something in person which is why i think um uh, historical societies and house museums and um historical reenactment institutions i think that's why i think they've been able to you know survive as long as they do besides passion from the creators but um people wanting to have that physical link to history i could talk about it a lot it's as i said it's like my uh, it's what i want to do yeah that's when you said why did they care that's mm -hmm. That's amazing. I mean, that, that's that's the question, right? Why did they care yeah. for this? It was curated. It was cared yeah. for, it was curated and taken into the present moment. And so archeologists now, I mean, we have this tradition now where we actually write stories. So like where your actual accurate, your, your attempts at accuracy, at your attempts at historical accuracy end, you know, have you ever thought about actually writing a, a fiction, like a, fic <laughs> a fictitious story about how it arrived to, you know, just a, just just it's yeah. something that it's something maybe you've studied maybe they 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 maybe they're doing this in historical um, research now I don't know because I, I all I'm really reading right now is historical archaeology yeah one of the, one of the things that they do is they actually write stories to try to try to get to that point of of you know why was this object cared for cared for you know to such an extent so yeah just enough. yeah I I don't think straight out historians encourage telling stories no. at least at least without saying clearly that's what it is yeah <laughs> wait a minute i, I run course. across that that's uh, you know <laughs> oh bye maggie thanks for joining us oh she left um well uh well so t i have two answers to that so um backtracking a little bit to give a little more context uh so this particular research class um the professor who was um I don't know, facilitating it. She kind of just let us do whatever we want. Uh, she specializes in uh, um, pre-contact uh, Native American tribes in um, the Northeast, essentially. I don't want to like give it too much specific, specific oh, you know, too specific in case um, I get it wrong. <laughs> but uh, she, she, um, you know, handles topics where there aren't a lot of archival evidence. And so um, the beginning of her class of this research seminar was all about, okay, well, how do you build a story if you don't have a lot of archival evidence of, you know, this is where so-and-so lived, 
Um, this is what they thought and did all the time. These are all their court records that they've ever done and like all the businesses they own. And the answer is um, you have to build a story out of what's not there. So for instance, one of the um, examples she gave of this was a very um, powerful <laughs> book that unfortunately I can't remember the name or author of, but it essentially told the story of um, uh, an enslaved woman walking through a city and we don't have a lot of information about her, but we know a lot about the city so we can construct how her day might go, what buildings she might have passed, what signs, what activities were probably going on at the time and we can have this whole narrative um, just about, you know, what she's not physically in the archive, but we can tell a story about her anyway. And so that's kind of, um, she, obviously my professor didn't hold us to we definitely have to do this level of meticulous study but um that's kind of like the theme she wanted us to stick with and so um that's uh that's what i tried to do a little bit in my research paper um and in this presentation as well obviously me saying uh over and over again about how we need to look for more context and how that's hard um but yeah, and then um, I forgot what the second part of the answer was going to be, uh, unfortunately. So I will just leave the answer with that then. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a very common thing in public history where, again, you, you find a cool old thing and you want to tell a story about it, but you kind of have to build a story ar around it. Like you have to describe what materials it's made out of to try and make it um, make sense. Bill, I don't know if you're raising your hand or, oh, okay. Oh, I remembered, I remembered what I was going to say. Um, uh, I did try to mm -hmm, hypothesize the connections of the family members um, very early on. Um, as Bill <laughs> mentions, uh, academic history doesn't really encourage, um, uh, or I should say traditional history doesn't really encourage um, fan fiction <laughs> about the materials. Um, and so when I was first looking at the scrapbook and at the articles in the back of the book and um, Anna M's notes and everything, um, at first, I thought that she really might have been Frank Tyson Jr.'s wife or maybe Captain Frank Tyson's daughter. And I was like, I don't know, it's suspicious that she's writing his name over and over again. But that's also kind of what we think of stereotypically as like a schoolgirl doing. So I was like, mm, maybe. Um, or, or trying to guess how Caroline and Anna M. both could have been married to Frank Tyson and why Caroline might be in that one other users uh, family tree, but not Anna M. Again, if I had to guess, maybe Frank Tyson and Caroline um, split up and then Caroline remarried and then her second husband died and either while she was still split up or after her second husband died, she lived with her son and his family. And that's why she's listed in the directories with all of them. Oh yeah, true, or marriage might not have been involved. Um, for a, a hot minute, um, uh, I thought an extra person who was listed in the census with uh, Frank Tyson, the captain, and Caroline Tyson and their children, some of the census uh, records list um, another woman with them. I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but um, they listed another woman as just like a lodger. And I was like, oh, a lodger, mm, what could that mean? Uh, until I um, looked at it again and realized that uh, that woman's last name was, um, I think, Kramer, C-R-A-M-E-R. -E um, and Caroline's middle initial is always written as C. And during that time when women married, they would take their maiden names as like their middle initial. And so I clicked in Caroline's backstory and saw that they were sisters. So that's kind of the, um, danger of trying to come up with a story before you start researching sometimes. Um, it, you could, you know, accidentally accuse um, 
a man of having a mistress when she's really his wife's sister. Um, or sometimes it can, you know, it can uh, give you a place to start. Um, and even if it ends up not being true, you at least have that place to start and kind of have an idea of a direction you want to go in uh, for research. Yeah, <laughs> if that made sense. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we are, uh, I would say we started at 105. So we're 10 minutes over the hour. Henry, um, was there anything else you wanted to do? Well, I would just like to thank you. And oh, thank uh, you. we've got a couple of really good questions. And this has been recorded and I think I'll edit it up and clean it up if it's been recorded correctly. And uh, so that others can see it in the future because there is no such thing as you know, stuff. And you, uh, I only have one other question. You, you made your own digital copy of this uh, yourself? Uh, the, of the scrapbook? Of the scrapbook. Yes, yeah, I, I took pictures of it. Uh, I will say um, the pictures are not, strictly speaking, to archival standards. So um, there's, there's, not, there's no glass or plexiglass you know, pressing down on the pages or um, gloved hands using it. Uh, so I do want to give that big disclaimer. I promise we were careful, but we didn't have um, a controlled environment. Uh, so if that's okay, then I would be happy to give you those those pictures. Thank you. That would be yeah. Fun. Really, the thing is, to, it, it, are they readable? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and oh, as, yeah far as, as far as wearing gloves, that's on a... a, a you know, institution by institution basis. Yeah. Some people believe that clean hands are absolutely acceptable. Okay. Uh, 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 and, and, and other people, you know, so as long as you're respectful and, and careful with this stuff, yes. just a little aside, uh, 1850 is about when they start using acid, they start using uh, uh, trees, acidic trees. Mm -hmm. So prior to that, most uh, most ephemera, what we call ephemera, um, um, was was on vellum, which is animal skin, or on a laid cotton base. Think the rag and bone man. They used to make their paper out of cotton rag. That stuff holds up great. I can show you some early 19th century documents in the archives of the DNA Canal Historical Society. You're not going to worry about hurting those. It's actually after 1852 when, when paper becomes acidified. And you'll see, I mean, I've got blue stones in my archives, uh, long story, um, that are already starting to show the acidification. Yeah. But I've got proclamations from 1825 on that laid paper that are as clean and beautiful as the day they were, they were made. So, so it, it's a question of the material uh, yeah. Know, well, I will say um, uh, we use natural light to take the pictures, no flash, and it was, um, you know, flat down. It, I mean, natural light, but it was also like under the cover of um, a porch. Um, and I will say all the pictures that I included uh, in this uh, presentation of the scrapbook, those are all um, images untouched that were taken, so they didn't really need any kind of um, uh, contrast or filters put on them. I'm sure if if you wanted to put it all online, you know, you could look into maybe um, changing the contrast a little to make it uh, clearer, especially on some of Anna M's like letters because she writes with like a like kind of a fine pencil. But um, otherwise, they 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 they're in good quality and they're large files, so um, I think people will be able to read them well enough. I had it explained to me by uh, by a National Park Service guide at um, at FDR's house that, um, and I'll get the numbers wrong, but a single flash is equal to like X number of years of, of yeah. UV. So that anybody here listening, it's photography is fine, flash photography evil. No, don't, don't yeah. go to it. You know. Yeah. yeah. So yes, I can um, I can email those to you or possibly figure out a way to upload them onto a drive or maybe get them onto a memory stick because the files are quite large. So I don't know how email might work, but we'll, we'll definitely, I can definitely do that for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. I think you know, it would be a good adjunct to this uh, future archive of this lecture. So. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff at the archive. I really, um, uh, I, I really did go in looking for cement specific stuff, but I just got distracted by all the other like really cool stuff that's in there. Yeah. It, 
it's a dive into into Dietrich's mind. Mm-hmm. You know, Jeff Jeff started a discussion of that a couple of meetings ago. It really, you know, what was he thinking? You start looking around at the stacks of stuff about all sorts of different yeah. things. It's oh my god, you know, it's staggering, but it's fascinating too. And, and and I think it was wise of Jeff to to to, to bring up the discussion, discuss the, the man himself because he they, you can't separate what we've got in our archives from that man. You know, he's you know very cool. Great. And there is his uh, grandchildren right there. Right. Right. Grandchild, I should spot say. to end. Uh, I'd yeah. like to thank everyone for attending. And, uh, you know, this is the first of our lectures that are presented online, and the technology is here. There could clearly be more of that throughout the, throughout the future. I think that, you know, uh, online telematic lecturing and presentations are here to stay. So uh, I'd like to thank you for all showing up and uh, we'll see you next time. So long. <laughs>